Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I am Ray, your humble host, uh, and I will be talking about a few things today, including some Lit RPG classics and some very new and up-to-date stories. Uh, and I apologize for the delay. I've had a heck of a lot going on in my life. I'll get to it in a second. But first, I want to say I hope that everybody out there is doing well. They're keeping safe in this very troublesome time. Uh, I know the COVID, COVID, whatever it is, 19 uh, illness is very much affecting everybody at this point. I hope if you are out of work that you're taking care of yourselves and that uh, you do get your stimulus package, your check that comes through. Uh, I hope that you are doing your social distancing. Again, for me, this is a perfect time. I, I love to be socially distanced from people. I am not a people person in real life. I, I am very good without actually interacting. Uh, I also like to stay home. I don't like to leave the house unless it's on fire or the police are dragging me away. Uh, so this would be a perfect time for me. However, I actually had a fall down some steps recently and I'm laid up. I can't walk. So I have a severe sprain on my leg. Uh, my ankle is really, really just in bad shape. It's swollen huge and everything else. Um, so it's not actually all the, the fun that I would think that I would be having at this time. Um, and, the reason for delays have been a couple things. I've had massive amounts of work since it started, uh, and my work computer was taken away uh, for two weeks to be repaired. And during that time, I had no way to record. Uh, and then when I got it back, just recently, my boss, for some reason, it wiped out all of my stuff on my recording uh, program, and I cannot get it to accept like my camera or my microphone. And he also has like a tracking thing installed to see how much work I'm doing. So even if I come downstairs at three o'clock in the morning, like I usually do and make recordings, it's going to show up that I've used the work computer. So I have to stay away from that. So I've actually kind of drug out an older laptop that I have and have reconfigured everything and got my OBS on here and I've got it lined up to work. So I can actually record now. Uh, and I've got a few extra uh, videos for today. And because this is the end of times, uh, we're going to have a very apocalyptic theme uh, episode. Although I hadn't planned on it like that, I just kind of said, you know what, I've got all these apocalypse books here. Uh, I might as well talk about them. Uh, so as we go through, you're going to see, I think everything here is post apocalyptic today. And again, it, it just kind of worked out that I had these reviews done and ready to go. All they needed was recording, and I just could not get to it. Uh, so next time, it won't be all one thing. I'll kind of keep it more diversified. Um, so with that being said, let's get into the show. I hope you all stay safe and well. Take care, and God bless. But now, the show begins! So the next book is Me Lee, book one, um, by Wyatt Savage, narrated by Luke McKeel. Uh, and it's got a book length of 8 hours and 15 minutes. We arrived a little late to the Strib Mall Dojo, and the white costume tykes were already in the midst of testing for a variety of belts, from white to some second-level kind of yellow belt and everything in between. I never took to karate. I know it's supposed to be great for discipline and all, but I never really needed someone shouting at me to become focused. I always figured that was something you had to learn on your own. Anyway, Sean was there with his wife, Kate, and their daughter, Kira, and they were watching their boy, Nick, stand ramrod straight and then execute a snap kick. The fact that I remembered their names without looking at one of my post-its made me feel good. Small victories. Sean adjusted his glasses, waved, and kept a finger over his lips so that we'd know not to talk. He was younger than me by two years, but had always carried himself like he was the big brother. He was the smart one with the terrible learning, as my dad liked to say. The family man with kids a massager of money for the well-heeled in Annapolis and Baltimore. So as I, I prepared this, I had just finished this book. And I have to say, it was not what I was expecting at all. I enjoyed this novel a lot. And, and there is a good deal of credit that can go to Luke McKeel for that. Um, he's a narrator that I cannot find like any other work from. So either he is an incredibly out-of-nowhere talented newcomer, or he's operating under a new pseudonym. And why this man would want to use a pseudonym, I don't know, because I really thought he did great for a first-timer. Um, and if he's not a first-timer, he did fantastic as a regular narrator. Uh, either way, it, it was a treat listening to him. So first, though I have to say that Savage 
is just that. He is a savage. The book, this book, Mele, is not for the faint of heart and, and it features things like children dying in pretty grotesque manners, um, man versus man that is most feral. Uh, there, there is no quarter ask, none given. Uh, even if you do ask for quarter, you, you don't get a change. You know, it, boom, they're done. They're, they wipe you out. Um, <clears throat> I just found the book to be very believable in the way that some people would work together and others went solo or banded together um, only so long enough that it was convenient for them to do so. Uh, the fights were exquisitely brutal and the unrelenting uh, part of the game and the game system itself was really hardcore. The, the, the game itself is up for manipulation by the people that are implementing it. And so, you know, you can know what you're doing one second and then the rules change. And it was really hardcore. Um, the only thing I think, well, I'll get into it. So there, there were a few things I did find hard to swallow. Uh, the first being that every man, woman, and creature was worth a mere 25 experience points. Uh, some monsters were really difficult to kill and should have had more experience than they provided. Similarly, many humans were weak and feeble and provided too much XP, in my opinion. On the converse side of that, there were some that were just absolute gods and they gave out 25 XP. So, I don't know. I just... It, it was kind of crazy the way that was set up. I get it. Believe me, I get it. It's really simple and easy, and it's very easy to implement and use as a writer because I don't have to think of a lot of stuff and do a lot of math. Um, I, you know, I'm always amazed with people like James Hunter and, and Dakota Crowd and, 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 and Chris Carney, the people that have like these, these elaborate, elaborate um, systems for gameplay. Uh, and, and it involves math because math is hard. It is hard. Um, you know, some of us didn't go to, to make it to algebra a, we were still, you know, in the, we put back in, in the back row of the, the comp, the math class that kind of prepares you to take algebra. Some of us had that. And so like math is hard. And, and so having a system like this in place, makes it really easy as a raider because you can just say, okay, 25 XP for everybody across the board and this level and so on and so forth. But there were also times as I was reading this and it was like, this is a level two monster or something like that. And they were so far off the chart power and then gave like no XP. And I'm thinking, God, you know, I understand that the aliens that are implementing this have say, but it seems like this is, is a natural thing across the board. Uh, the way they have it set up, and it just didn't seem right because I should not have to fight that hard to get 25 experience points. Uh, comparatively, uh, you know, if there's like a, a kid that's older than I can't remember what the cutoff was, but let's say they're older than 15. There's a, there's a 14 year old who's playing the game, and I come up and just shoot him or stab him or hit him in the head and kill him, and he's worth the same amount as the one that just about ripped my arms and legs off and killed 10 other people before it got to me. I don't know. So, like I said, you know, the, there were alien overlords that could reset, pause, and cheat anytime they want to. So that's that. But that was like my big issue with with the writing of the story. My only real significant is really significant issue is the amount of time it takes to get into the game of melee itself. Um, if you've ever heard me talk, you know my big pet peeve in reading is if you're doing a lit RPG book, if you're doing something like get into the, the game as soon as possible. You get into the game as quick as you can. You don't screw around. You don't goof around because no one cares for what happens a month and a half or six weeks before or a week before the game starts. Yeah, you got set up. You got a, a lot of other stuff. Damn, just get into the game because that's what everybody that's picking up that book wants to read. And I pretty much believe you need to get to the action as soon as possible. And here it takes a goodly bit of time to get there, uh, which basically means that there's a lot of character building and lets you get to know the characters pretty well. And that's a bonus. It's a bonus uh, because the characters are really well fleshed out and you care about them and their losses as the melee continues. Now, what I liked best was the portrayal of the human character that's done as well, you know, running through this game about right bloodlust. 
from, well, there's a gamut from bloodlust to betrayal. Um, and the opposite side is compassion and unity in the face of diversity. Um, Savage really captures those two dichotic ideas, you know, really well. I mean, he, he just knows, you know, this is the way that people are going to react and do things. And there's going to be some that do really good and some that do really bad. Um, he just writes a hell of a compelling story. It was really good. McKeel really amazed me for the first time hearing him. Uh, he told the story so that it flowed and had excellent pacing and didn't suffer a lot of that mid-sentence break that I seem to hear a lot. I probably don't talk about it as much because it annoys me, but it, it doesn't throw me out of the story. Like I say, like uh, mispronounced words do. But like they'll, they'll say something like, uh, let me go back and I'll, I'll say something like, uh, they went to the store and while they were there, they bought a can of tuna. Which, by the way, you know, so there was something that was wrong with that can of tuna. But there was a pause rather than saying, and they bought a can of tuna, which did this. And and so there's like this break, like they like the, the narrator usually doesn't know like to do this, to continue on with the sentence because the sentence is probably too long or it's whatever. It's a compound sentence. Um, and it throws a lot of narrators off. And he has none of that through here. I didn't, I didn't get any of that at all. And I was really happy. Um, and, and. He did a good job portraying the various people. Uh, did a decent job on the ladies' voices, although they weren't really enough women's characters uh, for me to do a side-by-side -side comparison, uh, which is how I usually do that. Like So I'll say, okay, like if this is Susan. Does Susan sound different from Betty? Does Betty sound different from Jan? And usually I can tell that pretty well. And like I said, there's certain people like Jeff Hayes. I can tell exactly which woman is talking just from the voice that comes out of his mouth instantly. Uh, whereas others, like I say before, they say something and it sounds just like the other person that spoke five seconds before. So this way, it, it wasn't problematic. I listened to the ladies and I, I just don't know. There was not like two women in the room at the same time uh, for me to compare that with. Um, and I And they were so far apart that it didn't really make a difference. So he kind of cheated on that aspect of it and got away with it. But I'll, I'll, I'll see more of Mr. McKeel, I am certain. Um, but anyway, what really impressed me was that I only heard one mispronounced word in the book. And this is where, um, if you listened earlier, he said chitin, or he said chitin rather than chitin when talking about a carapace. So if you listen to the first one I did about the the... the Culling a man, uh, that was no, uh, that was just an example I used. It happened here in this book, um, and that was it. Though, like I said, one time I can let that slide, even two or three, uh, but multiple times it throws me. Um, and here, and that was it. And, and he helped make this an experience, and I really enjoyed that. So I don't know where M Mr. McKeel came from. Like I said, I've looked. I don't see him doing anything else. I'm assuming this is a pseudonym uh, that he is using. But why he would do that, I don't know, because he does a really fantastic job. Final score is 8.25 stars. I need more melee in my life. Or is it melee? Melee, melee, melee. Me likey. That's all I know. Okay, so this book that I'm going next is called The Culling of Man. And I enjoyed this this book a lot. It's very apocalyptical. Is that apoc is it is that right apocalyptical? Um, it's a lit RPG apocalypse uh, with a, it's Perils Prodigy Book One, and it's written by Craig Kobayashi, which you know that's got to be a cool pen name because like the Kobayashi Maru from Star Trek is kind of like the, the the game you never win, you can't win unless you cheat. Uh, so I'm hoping that's a pen name. If it's a real name, that's even more awesome. Um, this is narrated by Michael Norman Johnson, no relation, and it's got a book length of ten hours and thirty minutes. Did the lives of her enemies if she stabbed them with it, sure. But melee really wasn't her forte, and the staff may be a weapon that would actually benefit her class. Gareth looked defeated as he pulled one beat-the-shit Chuck Taylor off and set it aside. Why not have your little demon go get it? Sharon suggested absently, one finger tracing the painted murals along the cave wall. Gareth thought about that. He hadn't tried to give any commands to the Flare or the Hound more complicated than kill. Between the two, asking the Flare to go fetch something was probably not his best bet. The Hound, on the other hand, had always seemed eager to please. 
Gareth honestly didn't know what would happen, but he knew he'd have to find out the limit of their intelligence at some point anyway. So he focused on the part of his mind he knew the Fellhound now resided. Get! He projected the word as he filled his mind with an image of the gold staff swaying back and forth a few feet below the waterline. So, here is a book that was fun and featured a new system with some unique classes. I enjoyed it a lot, but like I say, it had a couple hiccups. So let me talk about the hiccups with Johnson's narration that I had first, because I had some hiccups with Kobayashi's stuff as well, and I'll talk about those too. Um, Norman Michael Johnson is a pretty good narrator, um, but he did two things that made me kind of lower the score of the book just a little bit. Um, he has a clearly difficult time doing female voices, and that's a common ailment suffered by many of the greats. Like, you know, Luke Daniels, I think he, he is a great narrator, but his female voices all kind of sound like male voices, just a little bit higher octave than normal. And if he can throw an accent on top of it, he does even a little bit better, like Trella, Trella from, you know, um, MSE's uh, Tamer series uh, is like that. You know, it's, it's a guy's voice, it's a little higher with an accent, so it comes off as being female. Uh, Nick Podell, he, he, he's got a standard number of women voices that he does. Uh, but they're still male-ish. And the only one, and again, I'm not trying to push Jeff on anybody, but Jeff Hayes is the only person I've ever heard who really does a very realistic, believable female voice. Uh, and he has a passel of them. He's probably got four or five, like, stone cold, you can't tell they're not female voices. Um, and there's one other that I, I used to really talk about a lot, but because of an incident that happened with one of the authors in our community, with audiobooks, I'm not going to mention his name anymore. So I'm going to move along a little bit. Now, Johnson seemed to only have two real female voices. Uh, he didn't go very far into other things. In other words, he, he had two voices, and that's what he, he worked with. Um, and the real problem I had, I don't have a problem with him having two voices, because like I say, Luke Daniels can't do a lot of female voices. He has a couple. Um, you know, Podell, you, you name them. They only have a, a little box they can pull out of. It's got the, the, this many female voices. So I don't hold that against anybody. And again, I don't expect anybody to be able to um, just whip out a plausible voice for an opposite gender. It's great if they can. But my, my hiccup comes in that he had two. And it was one was young and one was an older voice. Now, the problem I have is, and, it, and this is not a spoiler because this happens pretty early on in the book, um, there is an old lady who's like 175, not that old, okay, she's she's old, like in her 80s, um, who becomes young instantly through the course of the apocalypse. And I'm not going to give you why that happened or how that happened, but it happens early, so it's no big surprise. Um, but after she transforms, she still talks like she's 80 throughout the whole book. And I would have thought, you know, that after after you become young, you know, you may still carry the mannerisms of an older person. Like, you know, you call somebody a whippersnapper, but I don't want to hear like a, a hot 20 year old going, yeah, young whippersnapper. That's not right. You know, like Catherine Hepburn voices, you know, no, I'm in your poop. You shouldn't be on that bow of that boat over there. You know, that is great if you're 80 and you've got issues. When you're 20-something, it doesn't play out so well. And it kind of threw me because every time I heard her, the nice thing was I knew instantly who was speaking, but it was still old lady voice coming out of a young lady's mouth. And it just kind of threw me off. Um, so I, I get that, you know, her vernacular mannerism hasn't shifted so much. as she like, like I said, she still called the MC young man and acted like an exasperated old lady. But her voice should have changed, and so I have to call him out on that. Now, the other thing, and, and this is one that really, like I said, reason why points are coming off is um, he, he mispronounced a lot of common words, or at least words I would expect people who narrate for a living to be able to pronounce. And, and I don't want to sound like it's, it's this exaggerated, overblown bunch, but there were, were many a time I was listening to a story and I said, did he just say this when it should have been? Like, it stopped me. And when, when I have to stop, um, that throws me off. I, I, I don't have the ability to just get back into the saddle and ride hard again because I've been thrown by a word. It's, it's, the, the horse has lost a shoe. Um, and, and I actually, and I don't want to exaggerate this, but it's almost like 
somebody coming to this country, it's not their English is not their first language, and and so they have trouble. Like they, they know like this is how you should pronounce things, and because English is damned hard, like what should be simple becomes infinitely harder than it should be. And and I thought, well, is English like is he like somebody who was raised in another country, but he's got this flawless English accent or American accent, um, or is it like this? Because there were words that were really simple. I thought that should have been done, and I wish I'd have like marked them down and tagged them. I didn't, but I can give you an example. Um, there were probably like I said, there were there were a lot of times. I'm not going to go into how many times there were, but I I took points off for this. Um, but like if it was talking about like the shell of a crab, and I don't even know if this was in a story. I'm just giving you an example here. Um, instead of saying the chitin, he said chitin. And that was that, that's something that drives me crazy because, like I said, if I'm narrating a book, which I don't do, um, I'm going to make sure that every word I speak is going to be as close as possible to the way it should sound. You know, like if I look up the, the Wuxia, W-U-X-I-A, I'm going to look and see that it's pronounced Usha. That's how you pronounce that, you know, Usha. Because when I didn't ever know what that was, I looked it up and said, okay, it's, it's Asian, it's Chinese, let's go through it. What is the way to say this? And so it's Usha. Um, because I'm just curious about that. And so when I have a word I know is simple, like chitin, I don't call chitin a very difficult word. Um, you, you should not do that. So I didn't take off a whole lot, but I did take a couple points here and there. Now, my only beef with the writing really kind of comes at the start of the book, and it's with the unending series of rounds the culling had that took place. Um, there was just one after another, and while the battles were really descriptive and graphic and fun, I found it to be a bit too rapid fire. Uh, you know, I think a fight scene should progress a story, even if it's just a little bit. Um, and afterwards, you need to give the reader or listener a breather. And I would have allowed for some character growth or interaction in between those, like, you know, here comes round one, and then here's round two, here's round three, because we had these countdowns again. So many hours, we're going to do this, this, and this, and this. And there wasn't a lot of time in between to really expand a lot of stuff. And I, I think you could have grown the characters, fleshed them out a little bit more. But more importantly, it just seemed like it was like one long battle after another for whatever purposes. Um, and, and so it, it was after that that it really became, you know, pretty cool. Um, you know, like I say, a fight scene should grow the story, progress a little bit, have character interactions, stuff like that. Um, but the system that, that Kobayashi came up with is actually pretty cool, and it's fun. And I like that like the MC is not a necromancer, he's a necrologist. Um, and there are things that happen, there's a negative side effect when he uses his powers. Um, that was really neat. Um, and so the earning of the XP, becoming addictive and stuff like that, that was a cool little aspect, and, and it was enticing, and I loved the the, the touches that he had, um, and, the, and the way he got around things, because he's a thinker. The MC is a thinker, uh, and that shows, as you go through the story, um, you know, the, the MC really, really puts thought into what's happening. And the upside is, is that after the gauntlet of the initial culling, the book really settles into a good groove and has the room to expand in both character development and story elements. So it, it is a boon. And, and once you get past that, the, that hump is hurdled. Um, the story then kind of takes a nice pace and it becomes really interesting. And again, I think just kind of shuffling things a little bit here or there could have made it a, a lot more interesting rather than like just pound, 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 pound. Okay, and now we got past that. This is what's going to happen. And I get he wants to show like humanity is getting whittled away and and wiped out piece by piece, and that's fine. But I, I still had the issue that uh, it just it just was too much all at once. Whereas afterwards, the fights were were more meaningful. They allowed for growth and development, and so it was it was pretty good. Um, so I think so putting some breathers in there would have been helpful. Um, but overall, and, and I mean this very sincerely, I really enjoyed this book, and it's just a mixture of things that came together. To kind of take cause me to take some points off. So, really, my final score is going to be like seven point six out of ten. Um, it's a fun book, and it's got some really cool new systems, some really cool new classes, um, and the interactions between the main characters are pretty fun. I, I, I enjoyed, you know, the older lady um, 
aspect of you know the old lady becoming the young gamer and, and how she joins in and, and how the gamers of the world are the ones who dominate and survive because the, this is the moment they've been preparing for their whole lives without realizing it um you know and that's that happens a lot in a lot of books but in this trope it really works well um for this story so you know if, if you like apocalypse stories or just plain old good old-fashioned good stories give this a listen the culling is a really good book and i think that now that we've kind of turned a bend on like the culling itself and we're going to get into like the real heavy heavy stuff this is going to be incredible i think the series is going to really pick up and come together and and like i said johnson like i say if he just um could do a little bit more with his wording and i wouldn't be quite so harsh but i mean 7.6 you can see where the story kind of levels at it was a good book but i did take off a couple points and it was for both things you know like i said i don't hold against him that he only had like the two voices um but the old old lady shouldn't have had an old lady voice throughout the whole book and i think it, it, it should have toned down and they should would have like like a great part of the book would have been like, wow, you, you sound incredible all of a sudden. Or, you know, they all think she's hot, but to not have that, that old lady voice would have been helpful for me because I can't see her as being, um, oh man, I'm, I'm old. So who was hot when I was into women? I'm married now and I'm broken. Um, Jenny McCarthy. Uh, so like, I can't see granny from the Beverly Hillbillies turning into Jenny McCarthy and, still speaking like granny and being hot as much as I love Jenny McCarthy, you know, back in the day, uh, that's really hard for me to see. Um, so that was kind of like my tripping point for the, you know, for the narration word wise, the speaking other than that, just make certain you get your wording down. You're good. And, and I, I honestly think that Kobayashi, um, now that he's past that, just that gauntlet of things, he'll do fine with the next book in the series. It'll be, it'll be good. Okay. And the next one for today is one in the gut, a post-apocalyptic lit RPG headshot book one by Matthew siege narrated by Vicus Adams, uh, with a book length of nine hours and 30 minutes. I did the bare minimum I needed to do to keep my body happy while I was in headshot, which essentially meant that I took a few minutes to cram new food in and push old food out. Once I was done with that, I got comfortable on the mattress in my sparsely furnished game room and put the helmet on. Usually there'd be a menu that hovered in the center of my vision listing all of the different games I'd recently played, but everything else had fallen by the wayside once the headshot beta had dropped. I selected it and then tried to relax, even though I could already feel the adrenaline starting to roar through my veins. There was a little countdown from ten to one that happened in front of my eyes as I closed them. I concentrated on trying to make sure my body was settled. There wasn't much worse than getting dragged out of the game because the helmet had noticed that you were laying funny on your arm and had cut off the circulation or whatever. I was ready to be in headshot for a while. One of the features of the game was the lack of time dilation. They could make time go faster in these things if they wanted to, but headshot didn't do that. Time was as precious a commodity as your hit points were, and you had to spend it just as carefully. Well, true believers, if you know me at all, then you know there are two things that I really, truly, and deeply love. One is lit RPG, and the other is horror. Uh, the one in the gut looked to be a perfect melding of the two, and I just had to kind of grab it. Now, I have to say that I really enjoyed Save Point, an earlier work by Siege, and I'll be reviewing it probably next time around. Um, and I just could not wait to put my grubby hands onto this book. It has a pretty cool premise, uh, but there was more than a few things that I felt made the book drag when it should have flown. Uh, honestly, the premise is pretty simple. There is a new horror game out that is free to public use if they play the zombies, uh, and those who are wealthy enough that have the money to spend get to play the survivors. The zombies advance by eating survivors, not by killing them. So you don't even have to be involved in the kill. You can just walk by, find somebody dead, eat them, and you gain experience. So that was a little wonky for me to start with. Um, and survivors, I assume, get points in other ways like finding gear or killing Zeds. The premise is the game opens for public consumption, 
uh, and everyone and their mother shut the country down to play. They don't intentionally do this, but everybody's so intrigued and they want to play this game that like over half the country is shut down and doing nothing but playing this game. Um, so people call in sick or don't show up at all. Uh, the MC manages to survive a little bit longer than normal, and he has to figure out how to keep going. And as he continues his undead existence, he begins to figure out little secrets of advancements and enjoys the game. Um, the story had a lot of potential, but the unclear game mechanics on both sides took away a little bit. But the main drag to the story was the way in which the MC constantly, constantly whines, cries, moans, bitches, whatever you want to call it, about economic inequality unendingly. And I mean, I mean that in, in the most severe sense. It's I'm poor and the other people are rich and it's not fair that I don't have the chance to play the other things and that they can, they can do all these things that I can't because I'm poor. Um, he might be poor and if you look about it and you read a story because he's literally calling off work to play a game. And he, he's complaining he doesn't have money to pay this or that, the other thing. And he's taking days off, taking money out of his pocket to play a game. That might be a factor into why the guy's poor. Don't know much, but I know economics well enough that if you don't work and you don't get paid, you don't make money. And if you want to make a lot of money, you do the hard work and you go out and you earn it. So it really didn't make sense, the constant whining that he had about how hard his life is when he's sitting around playing video games all day and doing nothing but literally calling off work. Um, so anyway, he looks at the survivor people as, well, they can miss work because they have money and they have the best gear. They have huge advantages that he couldn't get. Well, all the time he's saying this, he's stumbling along, finding new and cool zombie classes. So it was kind of like this dichotic, you know, there was cognitive dissonance for me because I was enjoying the, the new zombie strains like the Hulks and the, the runners and the schemers and you name them and the howlers and, and each thing. That was really fun. But every time he did that, it was still a, a moan session uh, about how he, it was hard for him to do anything. And he even goes so far as to to have issues with his ex-girlfriend and, and rummaging through her house in the game to kind of find out things that were, were what she had said, was whether it was true or a lie. And that kind of tells you what kind of person he is, because he literally goes and uses the game to find out things that really, if he did it in real life, it would be illegal. Um, and then he ends up you know, having issues with his girlfriend afterwards anyway. So the, the MC is not really either a great guy or really smart in a lot of aspects. He, he's just one of these people that I think kind of sits back and says, oh, gee, the world is against me. I need to strike back or I, I have to cry about it at the very least. And, and that was really off-putting to me. It just really really did. The story had a lot of potential, but the unclear game mechanics on both sides took away a little bit. And the main drag of the story was the way the MC constantly cried. Um, it was more of an indictment on class and anything else than it was about the game. Honestly, the way the MC bemoaned how the survivors had the easy way of life in every situation, um, it just got to me. It just it just wore me down. You can tell because I'm still repeating this. It wore thin with me, and the way that the basically MC the MC basically stumbled into everything, took away a lot of his agency. Um, he wasn't really actively doing things for most of the game. He kind of fell into it every step along the way, like, oops, I, I, I did this, or oops, this happened, or this happened. And the only thing I ever saw him really do with his mind um, to advance his character was going in a river. And if you read the book, you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, this book has got a lot of praise, and, and it really it, it isn't a bad book. Um, I enjoyed it, but I get it had issues and kind of just stuck with me. Like I just could not take all the, the whining and crying um, and, and other things along that route. Those just did not jive with me. And they kind of made me nuts. Like I said, story has tons of potential. It's fun in spots, but what seemed to be a real one modern societies have and have not detracted from the gaming part quite a bit. The other thing I found hard to swallow was that, people, and this is in the gaming section now, people were okay with the game being reset every week. So in other words, you start out on Monday, because they shut the game down on Sundays to reboot the system and clean it up. You start out on Monday as level one, and you progress until either you die, and then after you die, you're kicked out of the game, and you can't get back in until the next week, or 
you, you progress all the way, you build yourself up to whatever power levels you can have, and after that, it resets all over again. Now, I don't know if that was like that for the survivors. It doesn't make sense to me, because if I'm paying 20 grand a year to play a game, uh, and I lose everything I have, it doesn't make sense that I would want to do that. Because there's no way I'm paying 20 grand to start out and, and bust my ass the level really, really far, and then have to start out each week all over again. So I'm assuming that doesn't work well with them. Again, that's an assumption. And if they said it somewhere in there, I didn't hear it. But that's pretty much the way it seemed to me. Because if they do get to keep their gear and their levels, then after time, the, the survivors would become so OP that it wouldn't be really fun to play a zombie because you couldn't get close to them. Um, so I don't know. It, you know, it, it just, it's, it's, just kind of crazy the way that worked. I don't think it was a really well thought out system. If you want me to be honest with you, um, like I said, I think Siege did a really great job with the Save Point series. Uh, that was a really good book. Uh, the 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 audio book was fantastic. Loved it, and I was like, man, this is this is made for me all the way down the line. It's 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 spot on perfect. Um, and then it just kind of just devolved into a big mess. And I, and there are a lot of people that I've heard talk about how great this book is. And I'm sure that for them it was it was fantastic. Like I say, the writing's not bad. Siege can write. He is an excellent writer. Um, but there were just issues that I had. The more I looked at it, the, the deeper examinations I had. The MC's not very likable. He kind of stumbles around. The, the issues with class, uh, the, the issues with the resetting of the game every week, and so on and so forth. Those things just kind of just took away a, a little bit here and there until I just was not happy with it. Uh, and this is the part where I say that if you like Vicus Adams' work, you will enjoy this. He produces some of the same caliber work he's done in the past and is as professional as always. Uh, but for me, my final score is going to be 7.1. I really thought about it. I was like going to go with 6.9. Um, and because the book is for me, it's a horror book. It's lit RPG. This is everything about it. So I can't say the book is not for me. You might enjoy it um, because this book is made in my wheelhouse. This is totally right there. And I just did not enjoy this book as much as I thought I would. I have book two on pre-order and I will continue to get it and listen to it. I'm hoping it will change or at least explain a lot of stuff. But if book two continues right along the path of book one, and I never do this. I really don't ever, ever do this. I will probably just quit about halfway through and shelve it for a while um, because I did not enjoy the book enough for me to go through it all over again. So unless it picks up somewhere or does something new, different, or exciting, I'll probably just end where it's at and wherever I just can't go any further and, and come back in two or three or four years. Uh, but for right now, it's 7.1 stars. The writing's good and the kills are graphic, but it seems to wander like a lost zombie rather than going for the throat. And with a book named Headshot, one in the gut, you, you expect a lot more than what I got here. That's my opinion. But seriously, it was just not something I said, wow, this didn't blow me away. Uh, in fact, it was a big deflation of my expectations. I had a lot of hope for the book, and it just went down every second that we got further into it. Uh, it just just did not have things jiving the way I'd hoped it would. And coming off of save point yet again, as I say, it was a bigger letdown because I know what Siege is capable of. I've seen what he can do. I know he can write. And this book was not to that level for me. Again, it's not a bad book. And there are people that really love it. But in my opinion, there were things that just really detracted from the story enough that I just could not say I love this book. It's a good book. It's decent. But it's not where I'm going out of my mind saying I got to get book two. In fact, I got book two before I had read book one. Um, if I hadn't, if I had read book one uh, before this, I would not have ordered book two. I would have just let it go. So even if it's on pre-order, I'm going to stick with it. But eh, it's going to have to really do some magic to keep me around. 7.1 stars. Okay, so the next book I'm doing is Excise, a post-apocalyptic art lit RPG, uh, which is book two of Ether Collapse by Ryan DeBryan. Uh, it's narrated by Luke Daniels, and it has a book length of 16 hours and 40 minutes. He heard muttered exclamations around the fire, and a few people let out a surprised laugh, obviously receiving a similar message. Rocky shook his head, 
not at all sure how to feel about the situation. What else was he missing in his settings? He and Sella needed to have a very long conversation soon. The need to defuse the situation took precedence, so he tried to lighten the mood and asked everyone listening, How long did each of you get? And how many times did you get reported? Sella's face flushed bright red, and she tried to nonchalantly sit down without drawing attention to her clear attempts at trying not to laugh again. Rocky felt his jaw clench, and he stood up before he thought about it. What the Oompa Loompa did you stealing do, Sella? Rocky shouted. Everyone broke into laughter along with Sella, who had tears rolling down her cheeks. She held up two fingers and between gasps choked out. So there are really, there are some big names in the post APOC category of lit RPG, including, you know, the big, you know, Shinofen, Wilmarth, Wong. And I would like to add one more name to that list. Um, and that would be DeBrian. Um, his Ether Collapse series is top notch post APOC stuff that is well thought out, is detailed, and has a unique system, and even incorporates dungeons into the sci fi styled series. It has a really broad appeal with a sort of something for everyone kind of deal while still maintaining its lit roots. I mean, seriously, where else do you get aliens, Cybermen, Golems, or Golems, Golems, Gillums, dungeons, all in the same book? Um, the book does have a neat little system involving Ether that's in place, and the MC Rockland uh, is a fun MC. I enjoy him a lot. And there is a lot going on in book two, with Rocky trying to get the people at the beginning of the book here that he rescued at the end of book one back into his territory. Um, excuse me, Ramon. Lucas, seriously, either mute the stuff or whatever. I ask you to be quiet. Just mute it. All right, so I'll go back a little bit. Uh, the book does have a neat little system involving Ether, uh, and the MC Rockland is a fun MC. There's a lot going on in book two with Rocky trying to get the people he rescued back in book one into his territory safely. And along the way, we get dragons, necromancers, and storm-mutated humans that build into a great tale of danger. Um, Ryan has a really fun concept here uh, and creates a very vivid and detailed world uh, that kind of comes after the Earth goddess Gaia reawakens. Uh, and that's noticed because while she was asleep, the ether in that s section of space was completely void. There was none there. And because everything else in the universe runs on ether, no one could go in to investigate what went wrong. Well, now she's re reawakening. And so the ether is kind of flowing back into the universe, which is causing people to kind of notice things. Um, and so that's pretty cool. Uh, we also finally get a reason for why swearing is very limited after uh, the apocalypse, uh, like I say, um, it's it's a nice, neat little way of doing it. Uh, it explains a lot without taking away from the story, and, and, it, and it's meant to make it a fun little thing, and it's not stupid. Um, it's just it's a good aside, and it's an excuse for Ryan, I think, who probably doesn't want swearing in his book so much, uh, which if you lived in that kind of a world, you would do nothing but swear. So um, this way he has more control over everything, and he can get away with it. Uh, the book is a little bit longer than book one, so that's a plus. And like I say, the book is fun and fast-paced and has great characters. The world building is astounding, and, and the book even has a town building component. So if you like any of that stuff, this, this really fits well. I like the world that the Brian is, is, is crafting. Now, the story centers on Rocky, again, the MC, trying to build his territory as he is beset by ether storms and minions of a nihilistic god. Nihilistic or nihilistic? I, I know. Yeah, anyway, uh, this leads him into forging bonds in the market uh, with with some golems, um, dungeons, and so forth. Uh, while other factions outside of Earth are starting to take a really good long look at what's happening here. Uh, and this is a lot of setup for the third novel. And surprising, some of the groundwork that was laid out in book one is still put on hold, uh, and so I'm hoping it'll come out in like book three. Uh, because there's some things that happened in book one that were never really touched on or just maybe glancingly taken care of in this book. Um, so there's something really big in the future, and it's going to be amazing. I can tell that right now. I know it's going to be amazing. Um, the romantic overtones between Rockland and his ancestral guide continue to simmer, but I better see something substantial in book three. 
That's all I'm saying. Uh, I think the biggest issue I have with the story is that there is not a lot of progression. Uh, and by that, I mean Rocky doesn't do more than defend his territory or create allies. There's no real expansion, and yes, he, he does level up, as, the, as you inevitably do in this kind of a book, uh, but but that's about all there is. He, he doesn't, you know, do more than get some powerful allies, and, and after that, it's just pretty much, I'm right here. I haven't gotten more land or done more, um, and that's the issue with the second novels and series is, is they generally make the characters shore up their defenses rather than going for more. Uh, that's the appeal of like Shadow Sun by Wilmarth, for example, as he kind of keeps his people continually expanding their territory as often as possible before the aliens come down to start grabbing their land on Earth. And, and I think that's the difference between here and there, is that you know, whereas in Shadow Sun Book 2, it was all about growth and land grab, uh, Book 2 for uh, the Ether book, is pretty much so solidly just shoring up, you know, their defenses and, and making allies. And that's fine, uh, but I would have liked to see a little bit more growth somewhere along the way, like maybe get a little bit more territory in some capacity or another. Uh, and then that would have been really good for what happens in the book regarding the territory and Rocky and the contestation that occurs. Um, so I would have liked to see Rocky gain more land. Luke Daniels, does an amazing job per the usual. I feel that he fits the tone of his book more than he does like a book like the Completionist Chronicles. Uh, that's more his speed. Um, you know, this right here, this is this is it. I mean, this is where he's 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 meant to be. He's made less for pun based fun, and more for exasperation and disbelief that plays out in this kind of a book. His best work, I think, comes from portraying frustration. So, like, if you look, read the Iron Druid, you know, uh, the frustration there with the character is is all the time, and it really works well. Same thing here. Rocky has a ton of frustration, and it plays to Daniel's strength. Also, not a lot of female characters again. If it, you know, Daniels doesn't do female characters to the nth degree that some other artist narrators can. So, you know, having the, the, the female versions kind of, you know, truncated here works as, just as, as smartly, because he does a great job, but he's only got a couple of ladies' voices he can do. Um, the story, it keeps its lit roots well watered, and we get updates and notifications frequently. The action is solid, and the story keeps your interest enough you won't want to stop listening. I know I didn't. I didn't want to stop at any point. I hated going to sleep when I had to go to sleep and all that. So personally, I can't wait to book three. My final score is 8.3 stars. Check this series out. It's really building up into something special. Ho oh. ho! It's time for the Sambu Spotlight! Thank you, John Ralphio. Uh, today, uh, that's my Parks and Rec gag for the day here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, love Parks and Recs. I am Ron Swanson, 100%. Anyway, uh, Sambu Spotlight for the day is Shadow Sun Expansion by Dave Wilmarth. Uh, narrated by who? Oh, there's a lot of people here. Will M. Witt? Will Witt? The newcomer, sort of speaking. He's been around for a little while now, but does an amazing job. Annie Ellicott, Andrea Parsnell, and Jeff Hayes. Man, we got Annie, we got Andrea, we got Jeff, and we got Will. You can't ask for more than that. The book length is 17 well-worth-it hours and 21 minutes. Helen took Fuzzy and went behind a dumpster. After a minute or so, Alistair caught a wave from one of the ones that had gone inside. She was up on the second floor, her rifle barrel pushing out an open window. He studied his map, watching as the green dots of his party leaders moved around ahead of him. The one assigned to the water tower was in place and not moving. The group he sent to the hospital were in the right general area, but still moving. He figured they were in the building, trying to get upstairs. The perimeter groups were nearly in place, only three of the dots still moving, and they were already well past the camp, closing the circle. He waited another five long minutes until all the dots were in place and had stopped moving. Taking a deep breath, he stood upright and walked forward. He almost felt the shooters behind him tense up as he moved closer to the camp. So here we are. We're back with yet another Dave Wilmarth story. Uh, we seem to go long bouts without anything new and audible from uh, Dave. 
uh, and then we get clobbered all at once with his his catalog. So um, Shadow Sun expansion kind of picks up with the MC Alistair continuing to build his bases and mangle monsters and madmen while rescuing various groups of survivors. So if you liked the first book, you should absolutely love this one. Wilmarth has a penchant <laughs> for doling out justice, but he is the one-handed Norse god tier. Um, people are given chances, and when they fail to take opportunities for redemption, uh, they pay. Uh, and they pay like they've never heard of Geico, which could save them 15%. Okay? Um, yes, they really pay. Wilmarth can craft a battle scene that just makes the pages bleed and give the reader paper cuts, which is why I like my Audible account, because it keeps my fingers safe, um, and I don't have blood all over me from the pages. Um, he's also not afraid, and I mean that very sincerely, not afraid to whack characters right and left, but I am waiting for someone really close to Alistair to biff it uh, the hard way. Um, I think he needs a bit of a bite in the ass. I think somebody really, really close to him, really tight, needs to go um because that just makes it easier for character growth and i think alistair needs a smackdown a little bit more than what he's gotten um he suffered losses he suffers losses here um but he needs a smackdown because uh, he just does things a little bit too well sometimes now my only issue story-wise and that's hard to believe is that we end up progressing to the end of the year cutoff uh for the aliens arrival pretty quickly after a certain point like the book has a pace like here we are we're going this 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 and this and then whoop, we're going to just skip a couple months here and get to this and, and i get it I, I really do i get um that we basically had a play-by-play -play going on and skip a few months ahead alistair does build his power base up and is ready to take on the aliens when they arrive in book three so i'm really hoping that he finds out that they aren't as ready as he'd hoped and they get their butts kicked um if you want to know the, the only real issue i have is that the mc and his lady ranger friend don't have romantic feelings for each other um they are far too close and not only travel everywhere everywhere but also have saved each other's lives you know dozens of times so, so often that it has to be more to their story even if they they themselves don't realize that there's more to what's going on between them I, I just don't believe that men and women can be just friends i mean I, you know i come from that that thing um i, I firmly believe that dudes like uh, hang around women who are there so if their main person goes away they've got other people they can kind of go to and be like hey you know i've always had a thing you know because friends are friends uh and you can have acquaintances, work acquaintances, but when you're friends, there's a reason why. And, and so, you know, I just don't see Mrs. Ranger, you know, putting him in the friend zone for after everything. And there's got to be more to this. You know, like I say, there's always an ulterior motive. Uh, it's sort of like a backup. Um, so their obliviousness to each other is really just not realistic in my eyes. Um, you know, and, and as great as, you know, Alistair's girlfriend is, uh, She's cool, but if that was any real woman, she would no way in hell be cool with like you know him and the ranger shunting off into space every couple days uh, because you, you just you know in the trenches you get buddies for life because like life defying experiences, life threatening experiences, um, near death experiences bring people closer together than blood sometimes. And, you know, they've been through a lot of crap that would have made them bond tighter than you can imagine. So, like I say, otherwise, this is an incredible story. I really, really enjoyed it. I, I liked the uh, the gold heist sort of aspect to it. I don't want to go into that too much. That was fun. Um, flying the planes and getting to the islands and things like that. That was all cool. I really want to see Alistair expand his territory more. I want him to just say, like, this is mine and just bulk up, you know, his, his area um, as fast as possible. I just want to see it happen because the more he does that, the better the book becomes. Um, SBT is a stellar cast and Mr. Watts. Mr. Watt proves that he can really tell an incredible story yet again. And I have to say that, although there are a few times where the ladies sounded like they had been, their stuff recorded earlier and they'd be kind of added in, 
maybe by phone. I don't know. There was just like sound quality just got like shifted somewhere along the line. Like they would be talking, and then and I don't know if it was Andrea or Annie, but but it just didn't sound like they were they were there for the the thing. It was just kind of weird how it kind of went up, and you could hear it, uh, you know. But it was it wasn't. Um, a hiccupy as it was it was just kind of like that's weird how how that sounds um and i would go back and listen to it and it, and it didn't like you know it didn't have a click or a pop or a, a slippage or anything like that it was very flawless uh but there were just a couple times i noticed that that had happened um so it was kind of like somebody calling into a radio show for an interview while the the main people were on the main radio mic uh then the, the caller didn't have that that wonderful uh clarity and it was only a couple times but it was it was it was there it was it wasn't frequent but it was something i noticed it was very nice to have andrea parsno added in with the amazing annie ellicott and jeff hayes um book is just amazing it's outstanding i, I give it 8.4 stars um like i said for me it, it really really has intense battle scenes amazing characterizations it's very plausible. Everything that everybody does, you know, in, in the book, like I say, with, like, for example, Alistair. Alistair is, you know, one of those good guys that does everything perfectly because he has a moral code, and that's cool. Um, but it's believable the way he acts, like the way he, he orients himself. Um, it, it's very believable, aside from the fact that he's not tapping that ranger. Uh, because to me, there's just no way there's not a more of a connection there between the two of them. And the fact that they don't even see it or feel it, it, it just it, it astounds me. Um, because I, the first book, I thought, it, you know what this reminds me of? And, and I hate to even say this, and I'm going to kick myself in the morning for saying it like this, but it's kind of like, God help me with my kids. This is their fault. The Harry Potter, Ron, and Hermione triangle anybody with any sense would know that harry and hermione were meant to be together and how in the hell ron weasley ever came close to being a fit for hermione i don't know all i can think of is is like before the book was written rowling had this idea it would be great for harry to join the weasley family so Ginny was invented and because hermione had to hook up with somebody she made it wrong. And I know later on, Rowling herself has said she made a mistake and it should have been Hermione and Harry. But then that wouldn't have given Harry his in to the Weasley family, which is what it was all about, was making him have a family at the end there. Um, and sorry if that's a spoiler, but if you're reading Harry Potter at this age, uh, I just don't know what to say. Um, I hate Harry Potter. I hate it. But again, it is so accessible for me to use that. And I have read every single syllable written in Harry Potter to my children as the books came out and as they grew up. Very literally, I, I did that. Uh, every single book. And I didn't do it once. I did it twice because I have a daughter who is um, much older than my two other boys. And so I had to read to them the whole story all over again and talk about Ra really was rather I'd rather stab myself in the eye with a fork than do that ever again. Um, and trying to match up the voices um, to the guys in the movie, like you know, Dumbledore is great as Richard Harris. You go, ah, oh, yes, Hetty, you you know I have this. Thing. I can do that, but but when they they had to switch, it was hard. So I just maintained it, and then my kids were like, well, you don't sound like the Dumbledore that came in afterwards. Well, no da, no da. So anyway, I'm, I'm really digressing, and I'm sorry. I digress a lot. Um, and I don't even know what my point was anymore, other than the fact that sometimes certain characters are just meant to be together. And I think there's a lot of chemistry between Alistair and his ranger rather than his doctor and girlfriend. Um, just because. There, just, there is no way that there could be more happening to it. And I've just probably rambled for 20 minutes on a love story in one of the most amazing lit RPG series ever made that features the apocalypse and aliens, brutal deaths and killing and gold heist. And everything. that tells you just how much of an excellent writer Will Marth is because he makes me care that much about the characters. I really do. And like I say, you can't go wrong. Um, 
SBT really did a great job. Uh, every one of them. I mean, I just you can feel the emotions as they read this stuff. They they just do an intense, intense job with this. I love SBT a lot. So 8.4 stars for Shadow Sun, and I can't wait for more. Well, thank everyone for watching. Oh, so very much. I do appreciate it. Uh, taking the time, listening is just more than I could ask. Uh, so I just want to say, if you really want to support the show, as always, I'll ask you to like the Lit RPG podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page, or just like and share the video. I, I sincerely hope that you've enjoyed our show. Um, please leave comments or suggestions down below. I love the feedback. I enjoy talking back to you. Um, remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. And today's, uh, I won't go into it because I was going to make a COVID-19 joke, and that's just not the appropriate time. Um, so take care. God bless. Be careful out there. Don't do anything you don't need to do in the outside. Stay away from people. Just live my life for a little while and be, be happy. Um, but anyway, take care and God bless. It, it really is good to have uh, friends and family uh, over the Internet that we can talk to safely. So be well.